When our destiny is made, we will call it Botman. <laughs> That's like really active game mastering because, uh, and it's out of character game mastering, exactly what you said. We have like a director who actually cuts the game, breaks the game, and is shadowing. Can you give us some example of in character game mastering? Uh, well, that's from a game I know where you have all the players are children holding a carnival, playing cards with the devil. And the devil is the game master, and he's um, played by the game master, and has all the power to control their storylines. So they're actively playing with him and negotiating. Okay, yeah. The yeah. soldier in um, Snap Palette. Yeah the, oh wait, the, yeah, the soldier and Snap Palette. That's a really good example. Because I'm an in-character game master, but I still, when I played the game, I still provided you with information. Sometimes I need to give you uh, a lot of information and keep the players playing when it's inexperienced players. But I do that in character. I may present them with new challenges or new information all the time. So like feed them with playable things to play on if I see that they're like running out of things to play on. That's a way for me to be an active game master in character. Could we like agree that passive game mastering, if I write do nothing, is that uh, enough of a definition? Someone disagree? It's, uh, I would say maybe press start and then like press play on the something and then the game start. But maybe passive GM is no GM. Maybe. Why, why did you say it's at the same terms as every other character? Yes, yeah. what, what did you say? If, if you place it the same uh, uh, terms as every other character, it would also be Yes, it would, or would it? Could we like say that one? <laughs> 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 I'm going to call that the GM presence. Ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. We have press play, then do nothing. Do we have an example of games that you have played here during the summer? No, no but it's presented. The 1942. Yeah, the 1942. Was that... Uh, I wasn't at that LARP. You I were, Eirik. Was yeah. it... Uh, they just uh, began the LARP and then did, did nothing? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, yeah. They pretended to be people on the other side of the phone and somebody called. Yeah. Okay. So the... You would maybe put it like here, so there was still some game. They also send in NPC or players at different times. And have okay, players. so maybe we're actually when we look at it, they weren't actually present at any time, but they were the ones deciding when to send in the NPCs. So we actually like tilted up on the slider. Capo? Capo, yes, that's a good example. Because as I have understood it, they were actually like, when we begin our 48 hours, we won't intervene. We will do the interrogation scenes, but that's not a way to to um, intervene in the law and make it go in some way. Yeah, because they chose when to pull players in and out of play. Yeah, but yeah, of course, it wasn't a total passive, but it's still like an example of our game being done here. What do you think about new voices in art? Well, if we're going to go like, if you say yes, yes, louder, louder, when I... I'm going to go down here. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's also a kind of a, a press play game, and then uh, then everyone is invited. I'm going to check both my time and my. Uh, I have this awful nice. Uh, mm hmm. Yeah. So we've actually, uh, I have written a definition, so see if you disagree with me. The definition of an active game master would be any kind of actions taken by the GM with the purpose of influencing the play while the game is running. So uh, Emptying uh, the, the toilets in the fancy lore who wouldn't be active game mastering, that would actually only be a hygiene factor, according to this definition. What do you think about it? Well, I'm just, I was so, 
what is what is the definition of the person that prepares and instructs people before they go to play? Yeah, is I've left. A, I have actually. Person? Yeah, it's uh, it's often the same person, but I have left that out of active game mastering. That's more like preparations. So now you understand what I'm going to talk about. I'm only going to talk about what happens during play. So in some LARPs, we may uh, divide the LARP in different uh, acts. So we're going to play one act on Saturday, and then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to play one act on Sunday. Then all the workshops and all the things that the organizers do in between the acts, that's not active game mastering according to my definition. So there, there's my boundaries for these talks. We're going to wait a little bit more with the GM presence. And uh, uh, so this is almost like when I asked you for example, but what would the reasons be to have an active game master? Can you come up with some reasons for me? Yes? A uh, group of very inexperienced players. Even ex players. <laughs> yes. And why would it be good to have an uh, uh, active game master? Because then you can make sure that like, stuff happens. Stuff happens. That there is something to play on. Um, that they understand how to play. Yes. Exactly. Well, a lot of times when we do, as Miriam talked about earlier, when we do LARPs for inexperienced players, we always have very active game mastering uh, to, to uh, oh, no, not, uh, uh, almost always have very active game mastering. For example, you play the LARP Snaphane. In the original, you have a game master as Captain Wikström and also a game master amongst the other people. So when Captain Wikström uh, the military person leaves, you have someone to, to keep the game running at all times. And now, I'm going to write the cons, the drawbacks. You understand me? So one drawback of actually having an active game master uh, is uh, uh, for inexperienced players to feed them with information, is that they may become inactive themselves, because they get everything served on a play all the time, they get used to, they become lazy. So I'm going to write lazy player. So if you almost always go to LARPs, where someone is serving you all the information to play on all the time, you could end up with very lazy players. Not lazy, maybe that's a kind of meaning. Another reason for active game mastering? Uh, it can be a substitute for pre-game preparations. Yes, that's very good. Does that mean? Yeah, less preparation. Yeah, we'll, we'll call it that. Yeah. Less preparations. But the drawback for that would then be high workload during game. So if you have to have an active game master during your game, then that means a higher workload. We talked about uh, the game Carolus Rex, where someone, uh, some of the game masters were always sitting at the computer all the time to be ready to answer if the players would type something on their computers. You need a really large staff of people taking turns around the clock to make that active game mastering work. And the larger your staff is, the, the more complicated uh, it becomes. Um, if, if you have like a huge staff to make a LARP, then there will be a lot of time just communicating amongst the staff. Uh, very experienced players could also have uh, be the reason to have an action, active game, game master, I can't speak right now, uh, to challenge them, to push them, so you have uh, kind of the same with the opposite. Challenge, yes. Uh, like for instance, if you do the LARP, when our destinies meet, 
and you have someone who is really good as a director who can come up with really challenging instructions, then you can challenge experienced players. But the drawback or the con for that would be that someone might actually, they, they might uh, feel that uh, they don't get the flow because like the director uh, is always challenging us so we don't get uh, get any good flow in our play. Block, block. Yeah. Also called cock blocking. More reasons? If you have a specific story you want to tell, like you know you want to put the story going in this direction. Yes, that's right. And this is one of the tricky things with LARPs, because a lot of LARP writers like, imagine specific stories in their head, like, just like they're imagining, an, imagining a movie, and they, then they, uh, they need a lot of active game mastering to make the story unfold in that manner. I'm not saying that it's bad or good, it's just one way of making LARPs. There are some people who think that's the wrong way of making LARPs, that you should make LARPs instead uh, of, of uh, thinking about them as though you, you would create a lot of options for people to play on. But making educational games, there are sometimes, or almost always, we have a specific story. Because when we want them to play through the game, we want to have certain things to have happen during the game so that we can discuss them afterwards. So that's one reason uh, also why when we make educational games, well, we don't have like a specific story maybe, but we have two or three scenes that we want to act out so that we know that we have something to discuss afterwards. The drawback of that would also be the block flow. And less um, ownership of the story. Exactly. It's your story, it's not, <coughs> and not ours. And this is really, really important because this is also kind of an ideological failure. Some people who make LARPs, I'm actually going to, to, to take a little longer now because uh, we have, yeah, we, we've got time for, for the game. Some people who make LARPs says that LARPs is a participatory um, cultural event, like we're co-creating something, this is, uh, what's it called, this is not passive entertainment, it's, it's actually active entertainment, and some people says that only on this bit of the failure, it's actually a lot, when you're on this bit, uh, this uh, side of the failure, it's not really LARP, because then it's more of a passive uh, passive entertainment form. I don't say that they're wrong or that they're right, but I've, I've like heard those tendencies. So it, it might be, be good to know about it, that, that some people have an ideological reason to ha uh, make LARPs as open and as passive game mastering as possible, because they want the ownership of the story to be in the hands of the players as a statement. So, is there anyone else who has something? Mm, yes? It's more fun, but uh, when the GM gets too um, obsessed with fulfilling the story and um, goes actively in for stuff and the players doing something. That has happened to a lot. I was going to go to that, I had a lot of yeah, and that almost like kind of falls into the specific story and challenge because the game master just can't drop that great idea. And maybe none of the players think that's a great idea, but the game master wants to do it anyway. Uh, you can have someone who can um, have it like an overlook and see where you need to kind of push play. Like the, the broad view. Could we call it that? Yes. So then, yeah. <clears throat> so 
So you can actually have a game master that can analyze the game in a manner that the single player being caught up in events can't and actually see that if someone has a boring game, then we can do something about it. Um, if you don't have a specific story but have many options, you can uh, make up as you go along, kind of improvise. So if some players just uh, figured out the big puzzle and then, oh my god, they're moving so fast, now I have to make a challenge for them or something. Or they don't have any play, let's put a monster there or something. So you can improvise. Yeah, so, uh, and also I think you're touching a bit on pacing. Petter talked about pacing, and that uh, could be one of the reasons also uh, that uh, we know that we only have two hours to, to do this LARP on, so the game master might have to speed up things a bit. Or, we know that we have two hours, and it seems as though the players have already like played out all the plots in the first half an hour and don't have very much to play on. Either we can cut the lore, or uh, I can improvise things as an active game master to have more things to play on. I'm going to check my notes again and see if there was anything else that I could come up with here. I'm not sure if it will count, but uh, sometimes the GM has uh, a character that can help with practical stuff here in the park. Yeah. Would that be an active GM? The toilet problem. The toilet problem. <laughs> well, that, uh, that would actually fall outside my definition right now, but you can have your own definition. Um, the Game Master is uh, like this universal substitute for any NPC. Knowing all the story, he can step in. And at the moment he steps in, is it uh, uh, is this uh, uh, an advantage of being passive game master that he can step in, or he becomes active game master as soon as he steps in? Uh, it, according to my definition, and of course you can challenge that definition, he becomes an active game master as soon as he steps in. Uh, these are some of the reasons, and uh, the. <coughs> There are also reasons for being a passive game master, and I'm not going to write them down, I'm just going to go through them quickly, because these cons actually quite explain a lot of why you would want to be a passive game master. But uh, one reason that we haven't touched upon is that you may want like a natural uh, development of events. You may want the events to unfold as though they would, uh, and, uh, and you can't really foresee uh, as a game master what will happen if I actually step in and meddle with these events. Maybe you think something good will happen, but then again, maybe the players are happy just as it is. And uh, yeah, you have less workload if you're a passive game master. And one of the things that you have to be careful about is, which is happen a lot of times, before you make the LARP, decide if how active you're going to be. Of course, that's what we're talking about all the time. You have to decide on the failure beforehand, because there are so many Swedish fancy LARPs where they have designed the LARP for kind of, uh, what did I say? This is active, yeah. Uh, for a really active game mastering. And then the preparations and the workload and the logistic take so much time and so much stress out of the organizers that when the LARP begins, the, the organizer is stressed out, actually hides from the LARP, doesn't want to interfere, and gets a sense of like, yeah, but the LARP is running, it's probably okay. So they actually design the LARP for active game mastering, but the game master uh, it isn't up for the challenge of actual game mastering because he or she is so tired after all the preparations uh, and then you can't actually get all the good plots that it was designed for. That's not a problem if you design the LARP for being quite passive, like Capo, then that wouldn't be a problem. But if you design it to be active and then don't show up, then that's a problem. It has happened a lot of times. The other way was the problem as well. Yeah. If, if, if the player expects to be able to control the story itself, and suddenly the game master is running all over the place doing stuff, that makes it a very uncomfortable game for everyone involved. Actually, and then we have the transparency failure. 
Um, I, I would prefer that you communicate to the players how much will the game master be active, uh, because then we can manage expectations. But some people will want the LARP to be a mystery, and then those things end up a mystery as well. Well, now we're going to step into the, the thing that we talked about here. The game master presence. The game master is actually at the LARP, but is not actively doing something. Would that be passive or active game mastering? I argue that that would be kind of an active game mastering, because I have a number of examples. If we are at the fantasy LARP, that the game master uh, is actually, uh, he's kind of, or he or she is kind of active, sends in some NPCs, helps people with things, and uh, during the times when the game master isn't active, he or she just walks around at the LARP, LARPing as anyone else. Then there is a tendency that he or she may become kind of a center of attention, because people may think that well, maybe the game master will drop some juicy rumor, or maybe someone will be instructed in some way. So the game master's presence actually uh, influences the LARP, although the game master isn't actively doing something. Uh, we have that example we have in Denmark as the boss at the Christmas party. Uh, even though the boss is drinking and making jokes and acting like anybody else, everybody's still a bit cautious because they just still might get fired for saying the wrong thing. Exactly. And, and unless you have a really open dialogue and you have a transparency, then and and some awareness of that as an organizer or game master and actively work against that, that is the prejudice that we will end it. Exactly. Same as teachers at parties. <coughs> So the presence of the game master can uh, influence the play in a bad way. It can also influence the play in a good way. For example, uh, one of the examples is, uh, you've heard about Trillian Slump now. Uh, the, uh, they had a black box. And uh, for instance, if me and Petter were to go into that black box and play out a very, very emotional scene, maybe a sex scene, uh, we want to play out the sex scene, and if we're the only two going into the black box playing out the sex scene, it might be a bit uncomfortable for me as a player, because then it becomes, we're alone there, so it becomes like the, the, the layer between the player and the character, you might start to, start to doubt that, but if you have a director at the black box or a GM present, then it's totally clear cut that this is a game, and that way the game might run more smoothly well, when oh, only with the game master present, the game master doesn't even have to do anything, or an audience present. Uh, Peter? No, just another example of what you're saying now. It could be like some some situation in the yeah, you're presenting something in the LARP that it could be like, are we really allowed to tear down this big wall in, at this in this uh, occupied home? And um, if an or like in a Think of an apartment that someone is like banging down the wall with hammers and stuff, like they're tearing down the wall. And then an organizer is participating, uh, could be often signed up as a signal as this is an okay thing to do. This is not just a, like some fucked up participant made up. This is this is this is a total okay thing to do. So if you're doing something really unexpected and you also have really communicated that this, th th these three persons are the organizers, otherwise it wouldn't work, of course. They need to... So, like, just, yeah, just making your point, like, feeling of, it could be a feeling of safety and that this thing is okay. Exactly. So I'm going to, like, finish off this little talk, this little discussion with, uh, with Active Game Mastery and say that this is one of the failures that can change during the game. You could actually begin the game with active game mastering, and then after uh, one act you can have uh, no game mastering, passive game mastering. And some of the things that you would maybe like to do as an active game master, you can outsource them on other players. It doesn't have to be one of the organizers always directing in the black box. It could be uh, some other players who are good black box lurkers, so that you can take the workload off yourself in the things that you would normally label as active game mastery. And, final thoughts about this is, uh, again, communicate with the players. If you have designed a game to be very passive, 
and the players feel that you're not doing anything, they could get the feeling that you lack in responsibility as a game master since you're not helping them in their play. That can be avoided by communicating uh, beforehand. So that's all I wanted to say before we play the boring family dinner again. But I'm going to ask you, do you have any final questions? Was anything unclear? Uh, yeah? I have a question. If you have a team of game masters, like two or three people, and some, some of them consider that they should be active, and some of them consider they should be passive, what to do in this situation? Well, uh, then you're in a kind of crappy situation. Then, the, then they do have a problem long before that, and that's uh, the communication within the organizer's team. Um, and that's one, that this isn't actually part of the part of the active game mastering, but this, I just want to, to make an illustration here. Like, the size of the organizer team is so important, because if we have two organizers, you have uh, two relationships, right? My relationship to you and your relationships to me. And you have to know that the size of the team, the number of relationships within the organizer group, the number of communication ways, uh, actually go up exponentially. So we have two relationships here. If we have three organizers, <coughs> we have six relationships. Are you with me? If we have four organizers, we have uh, it's 12 relationships. And if we have five organizers, you actually get 20 relationships. And you can see that this is clearly bad. That's a bad sign. <laughs> okay? Erna? Um, I think this uh, discussion, uh, I'm a father, so this is bringing up children, things occupy my mind uh, at times. Uh, and uh, it's. Uh, and also some theater directors, particularly when working with masks and very acidic theater, but I think it applies to LARP also, because the character is a mask in some way. That uh, the first they hear about, uh, they are asked what they want to play, kind of the idea is born about this character. And then after a while, you as the organizer, you kind of bring up the child. First you change the diapers and take away the crappy stuff about this character, so the people know exactly what they uh, are playing, but gradually they will grow older and they will get younger siblings, his grandbrother. So after a while uh, the kid can be, I mean, and this can happen like in a couple hours before the game starts. Uh, and then the people who have sort of matured <coughs> before the game uh, starts and it can be very different. You can work a lot with a few characters and less with others because some of them came two hours before the game starts, then some of them came at once. Yeah. So then they can be the older brothers showing the other people and be role models for each other. So it's kind of this kind of family thing. And also, there goes all these uh, things about GM presence, it's also the same thing about parenting. That if you are, yeah, if, uh, if you are uh, very much present when the kids uh, <coughs> argue, they will always look at you to decide who is right. But uh, if you do that too much, they will always run to you, even when they're outdoor arguing uh, with some neighbor kid or something, and it makes them very uh, um, uh, dependent. In, yeah, yeah, dependent. Absolutely. I'm going to catch you there because now we're actually treading into the law philosophy. But the presence of the game master, yes, it could happen in groups, it can happen with experienced players being present with inexperienced players. But I'm going to quit now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we have five minutes before Eric goes on. Do you want to run the boring family in a lock, Martin? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So you know your groups for the Boring Family Dinner, so go outside organizing your groups and you get the instructions from the organizers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>